Welcome everyone to the Religious Studies Lecture Series in the Department of Classics and Religion here at the University of Calgary. I'm going to begin with our land acknowledgement and then I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Tikani, and Gaina First Nations, as well as the Sutina, First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Shiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our administrative team, Courtney Canavay and uh, Brigitte Clark, for their help organizing this lecture, as well as the chair of the research committee, uh, Leslie Benson. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tanya Marie Lerman as our guest lecturer today. She is the Alberta Ray Lang Professor at Stanford University in the Stanford Anthropology Department and Psychology by Courtesy. Dr. Lerman's work has had a significant impact on questions related to the nature of religious experience, theories of mind, and the overlap between encounters with the divine, especially hearing voices and madness. Her long list of publications and awards signals her immense contributions. In addition to her many articles and edited volumes, we know her for her books, Persuasions of the Witch's Craft, 1989, The Good Parsi, 1996, Of Two Minds, 2000, uh, When God Talks Back from 2012, and most recently, How God Becomes Real, which came out with Princeton University Press last year. She has held grants from every major funding body in the United States, uh, including the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the Fulbright, the John Templeton Foundation, the Social Sciences Research Council, and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, to name just a few. In service to the profession, she has held or holds leadership positions in the academic associations that shape the fields of anthropology, psychology, and the social sciences more broadly, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Anthropological Association, and the Society for Psychological Anthropology. What all these prizes and responsibilities reflect is the way in which Dr. Lerman's scholarship wakes us up, opens our eyes, and alerts us to the beauty and mystery of the world. As one of my favorite reviews of When God Talks Back puts it, Lerman makes anthropology big again by boldly synthesizing theoretical problems and questions while at the same time writing in a poetic narrative voice that captivates the reader. We are honored to hear Dr. Lerman share with us today from her new book, in a talk entitled, How God Becomes Real. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Lerman. Well, thank you very much, Joy. And that was just a, a lovely and very thoughtful introduction. I'm, I'm, very, very, I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, you've set the bar high. So anyway, but thank you so much for having me and for your interest in the, in the work. And uh, what I'm gonna do is to talk through the, the main argument in how God becomes real and to try to talk about some of my, my older and more, more recent uh, work. So the cognitive science of religion has made a huge impact to the field of religious studies, whether you, well, it's made a huge impact. And what it's done is to basically make the case that that believing in invisible others is, pl is, is, is plausible, that it comes naturally, that is sort of part of our cognitive, hardwired cognitive stuff. And you know the way that this argument works. Our, um, and our ancestors were more likely to survive if when they heard a rustling in the bushes, they overinterpreted the possibility that it was likely to be an agent, often a bad agent, a jaguar, a lion, a, dangerous a dangerous other human and because of this kind of inclination the survival of those who overinterpreted we have become a people who overinterpret agency and that's why the idea of invisible spirits seems kind of not ridiculous it's something we sort of take take for granted and i think that that is um this body of work makes a powerful and compelling contribution um, I'm talking about sort of the other side of the problem, which to some extent I think is um, even deeper, which is the puzzle, not of why the idea of the invisible other seems plausible, 
but why, but how spirit comes to feel real. And what I do in this book is I look over this kind of the work I've done in religion over the course of my career and try to say, okay, what have I learned about how God comes to feel real to people as if God were almost there as a people among persons, as a person among people, sorry. Um, and, 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 and as if there was a sense of visceral, visceral there-ness to the nature of spirit. So I work with two different ideas, or at least I, I think they're two different constructs. There's a story of belief, and there's a story of experience. The story of what I'll call a faith frame, or the cognitive commitments that we might hold about indivisible beings. And then there is the question of how people come to experience those, those beings. And I think that I'm gonna argue that um, experiencing beings takes work, feeling them to become more real takes work, and this work changes people, and that helps to account for the enduring power of faith. And you can run this argument whether or not invisible beings are, are in some sense real. But for the purpose of this talk, I mean, you know, sort of just kind of put to the side the question of whether uh, God exists in, in, in a metaphysical sense. But I, I, I do want to begin with the observation that the tension between belief and experience is a live challenge for people of faith. That um, people, you know, I, I spent time with people who would say, you know, Christians, deeply committed Christians who would say that they, they wanted to believe more, they wanted to experience God more deeply. Um, I could see that people, even deeply faithful people, would, you know, go to go to church and resolve to be even more committed, you know, even more faithful, even more like Jesus, and then they'd get into the car, and they'd yell at their kids. It was just so easy to, to forget that God was there. And even deeply committed people sort of hold God differently than they hold um, the world of tables and chairs. So people might be very devout, but they never ask God, who can do anything, to feed the dog. They kind of mark God in some ways as, as different. So, so my question is, how, how does the, if, you know, I think that as people learn to make God feel more real, the kind of the cognitive commitments come to feel more and more, they come more and more in focus with the kind of the everyday experience of the world. So this is a story of real making. And what I'm gonna do um, for, for the talk is to really talk our way through five things I've noticed. So I'm, you know, I've, I've spent time with, as Joy said, with, with people who call themselves witches, with Zoroastrians, with, with evangelical Christians. I've spent time, I got myself initiated into Santeria, joined a Baltri Bashul, so many different kinds of faiths. I think these five things matter to those faiths. I don't know if they matter everywhere, but so these are five observations I, I've had about the way, I, talk, I use the word kindling to talk about real making because I think that these are ways of encouraging small acts of, of attention that help the sense of God become feel more, more visceral. And I'll talk about what I'll call a paracosm, about proclivity, about practice, about porosity or model of mind, and phenomenology. So let me begin by talking about a paracosm. So a paracosm is a word that uh, typically is used to describe a shared imaginary world. So it, I think that it was first used to describe the, the shared world that the Bronte children created together, that they invented a language for, that they told stories about, there were a couple of different worlds. We share a paracosm in Harry Potter. And you know everybody knows, many, many people know the story of Harry, they know who Hermione is. One of the things that, that a paracosm does for you is it gives you so many details that you can elaborate them and make them your own. So you can have a view about whether Dumbledore is gay. You can have a view about whether Harry should have, you know, partnered with Hermione. You know, whether, you know, it, it, even though J.K. Rowling didn't write any of that stuff, you can develop it and make it, make it your own. And I think that good religious, good effective religions are often 
paracosms. They are richly woven, they're, they, they're, they create narrative worlds that are richly woven that people can sort of walk into and make their own. So I, I remember hanging out with people in Bible studies where you know, you know, people would be reading the story of the prodigal son and they would say, oh, that happened to me this afternoon. Or you'd be reading Judges and somebody would say, oh, that happened to me last Saturday. They're able to use these stories. And one of the things that I saw in doing this, my research is that paracosms, these narrative paracosms, these richly detailed stories about uh, inner faith provide rules to say who participates in this world, who knows about the spirit, how does spirit show up, and then rules about how to interact with spirit, how to know that spirit is speaking, and how, and how to, to speak back to spirit. And so just to talk briefly about um, this, the evangelical Christian story, this is the kind of, so I, I did my, my work in a, a, in a church that could be called a neo-Pentecostal church, a world in which God is sort of modeled as deeply human and deeply supernatural. There, there are many, many, many kinds of these churches. Uh, the particular one that I was in was a vineyard Christian fellowship. Um, which tends to com combine these more conservative theological ideas with these more um, kind of liberal social styles. This is the church that I, that I was in in Chicago for a number of years. I came to know these folks really well. And what I saw is that the church would teach people how to know who the spirit was. So the, here's the kind of book that people would read. Um, they would hear Bruce and Stan tell you that you know, God is a person. He's not an impersonal force. Even though he's invisible, he has all the characteristics of a person. He knows, he hears, he feels, and he speaks. They would say that they would teach people that you had to learn to talk to God, that your conversation, that God's conversations were with Moses were the normal human life that God intended for us. And I thought that I saw that the church taught to people to think differently about their mind, that their mind wasn't private, but the thoughts and images and sensations that you might have taken as self-generated, some of them, they came from God. And then the church had to teach this kind of the paracosm of the church had to teach you which ones counted as from God. And so let me just give you an example of the way that people talked about this. They would say, here's a woman who's talking to me about her prayer practice, and she says, I start praying for somebody and they, they describe their situation, what they want me to pray for. And so she's standing next to a person that she's praying for. And she says, I start praying. I start trying, you know, to really experience God. And I see these vivid images and then she's explaining the vivid images to the person she's praying for. And then she checks into the, with the person she's praying for. And she says, does this, does this resonate with you? And the other person said, yes. How did you know that? And so her, what the church invites them to do is to think, oh, this image in my mind that was so helpful for the person I was praying for, I didn't bring it up, the human didn't make it up. God placed it in, the, in their mind. And the church had a series of kind of discernment rules that helped people to identify those thoughts. They would say that the, 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 you know, if a thought popped into your mind, if it felt more spontaneous, it was more likely to come from God. So people would say, you know, here's a woman who says that people are praying over me. I'm just receiving it. And all of a sudden I hear go to Kansas because I was debating to go to Kansas where her parents live, but I hadn't been thinking about it within a 24 hour period. So that quality of spontaneity, that's a kind of feature, the texture of thought that people are invited to pay attention to. They, however, they're also invited to say, okay, to test, they call this testing against scripture. Did it sound like God? So, you know, the pastor once said, you know, we don't expect God wants somebody to cut themselves or to jump off a bridge. If you think that God is telling you that, you're wrong. You're making a mistake. People would talk about peace. They said, here's a young man. He's, he's who's about to join this church in Chicago. And he's explaining to me how he came to the church. 
and he was at another vineyard and he said he was he was in that other vineyard and he just felt that god put the, the idea of the new vineyard in his mind he didn't know that other church he knew there was one he he'd sort of heard about it being planted he didn't know anything about it he didn't really spend any time in that church but he had this feeling of peace and he couldn't shake it he kept in his experience talking to god he couldn't shape this shake this feeling of peace and that's how he knew that God was telling him to move into the neighborhood of that church and attend that church. And people will talk about seeking confirmation. So this is from a young woman who um, was in a studio apartment. She lost her job. She's trying to decide whether she should stay in the apartment. So she, um, she asks her friends to pray for her because if they get the same message that she's getting, it's, that's going to confirm, going to give her more confidence that God is telling her to stay in the in her studio apartment. So she explains to me that a friend's you know praying, and the friend saw her in the studio apartment, and then she says, "Okay, I I, I respect her. I respect what she's seeing. I need to take that into account. Doesn't mean I'm going to. It's clearly God, but it gives me more confidence that it might be God." And, that I, and she, but she, she still wants to test it a little bit more. She stayed in the studio apartment, despite not having a salary to support it. So, it, so one of the things you see in this world is that there's you know people teach the church teaches people how to pay attention, provides them with the tools, and in a world like this, it demands this constant attention to inner experience and this toleration of the fact that you might be wrong in judging when God has spoken. And although more recently I've spent time in churches like the like this Chicago church in South India and in West Africa, and there are many differences between these kinds of churches, but I would say there's a similar kind of sense in this theological world that you look to look you look for spontaneity, for for the, whether you test it against scripture, you look for a quality of emotion. And then you want some kind of additional confirmation that God has really spoken. Okay, so that's a story about the paracosm, this kind of vivid narrative world that teaches you how to find the, identify the presence of God. I have a story to tell. I think that proclivity makes a difference as well. So um, in many, many different so I also do some psychological work. And one of the things that is robust in, in my work is that this scale, which is called the absorption scale, predicts, to use a psychological word, the people who have more vivid experiences of spirit. So this is a list of the, the absorption scale devised by Alki Taligan and David Atkinson. 34 items, uh, and you give it to somebody and they say that the, the, these, these, scale, these sent statements are true or false for me. And only one of them has anything to do with religion. And one of the things that's really striking to me, and we've now seen in five parts of the world, and I'll talk about that in a second, is that the more truths somebody writes on this piece of paper, the more they are likely to say, that God is a person, that they experience God vividly, that they have spiritual experiences like voices and visions, and that God feels more real to them. So there's something really robust here about certain people who are more likely to have these experiences. And I think that these, I'm still in myself kind of fretting about what makes, why these, the absorption scale does the work that it does, I think it has. I think there are two pieces of it that are really important. I think it invite it. I think people who like those statements um, are more able to suspend disbelief, their own skepticism, perhaps about this person they cannot see. They're also more likely to have vivid inner worlds. I also see the practice can make those inner worlds feel more vivid. And I think you may be hearing my two pandemic puppies who have been such a joy for me during the last um, 18 months. So thank you for tolerating their enthusiasm. Okay, so one of the things I see, uh, I've seen in my work 
is that um, there's a story that I call inner sense cultivation. So when people pray, they need to represent in their mind something that is different than what they see before them. They it doesn't mean that God is imaginary, but they are using their imagination. And so people talk to me about sitting, sitting in God's lap and, you know, um, I mean, witches would talk to me about having conversations with the goddess. They would talk about strolling with the goddess. People will talk about um, sitting on a park bench with God's arm, arm around their, their shoulder. Um, they, they're doing something that uses the imagination and these, and, and that's something that's pretty basic to many, many religious practices. I was struck when I came to the evangelical church that people often said the same kind of thing as they did in um, when I was hanging out with witches and magicians. They would say, you've got to do something to experience what we're talking about. You've got to pray to experience God. You've got to do rituals to experience magic. And often the, what they were talking about was something that used the imagination. They would say the stuff that you've got to do, it's hard and it takes practice. And at least one of the things that was hard was taking it seriously. Assuming that if you are kind of dancing around a magical circle, you're actually doing something that matters. If you're talking to, to the Christian God, it's not just speaking words into the air. They would say that some people are better than others. This is why I became so interested in the absorption scale. People kept saying that, that some people are better at praying. Some people are better at magic than other people. People would say that the good who, people, the ones who are good and who practice, they change. And they said a whole bunch in the magical world and the evangelical world, they said a whole bunch of things about how you would change. They would also talk about their mental imagery, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I noticed that they reported more unusual experience. So I was observing as an ethnographer that people who entered these faiths, and I saw a version of this in Zoroastrianism as well, people who entered these faiths, hung around in the, in the, the church or the temple or the, or, or, or the coven, they would report sharper mental images, which does not have anything to do with um, did not have anything to do with being pious. They would report the things they had to imagine would feel more real. And they would report more cool, weird stuff, spiritual, you know, interesting spiritual experience that had sense, intimate sensory experience of their God. So I ran an experiment in which I got a hundred people who, um, who, in this case, charismatic Christians brought, brought them into my, my office. We talked to them really carefully. We uh, sat them in front of a computer screen and had them do exercises with their mental imagery. And we had them fill out a bunch of surveys. And then I randomized them to lectures on the gospel or imagination rich prayer. And the folks who and that were in the prayer condition after a month of this, they had more vivid experiences. They were more likely to say they'd had sharper mental images, more sense of God's presence, more sense of God as a person, and more cool spiritual experience. And I think that what um, the inner sense cultivation, again, I think you see this not only when people are praying, but when they're in the congregation, when they're talking in Bible study, when they're walking with other people in the faith, they're, you, they're cultivating these inner, inner experiences. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about more recent work and what I think about the, the theory of mind, the model of mind that helps people experience God more vividly. I'm going to talk about the, this model of mind as porosity, a term I borrow from Charles Taylor, but I'll, I'll get to that. So I want to point out that you have a lot of ideas. You can ask a lot of different questions about your thought, about how you experience your own thought. And I want to invite you to um, realize that you have a lot of conflicting intuitions about your thought, even if even deeply secular people have conflicting intuitions. So we mostly think that the mind is located in the body. And when the body goes, when somebody dies, they stop thinking. But even very secular people can sometimes have a sense that the dead person lingers on and is sort of available. Um, 
we have the sense that our minds are private, that nobody else can see in, but even secular people kind of have this intuition that twins somehow know what each other is thinking, at least in moments of crisis. We have the sense that we own our thoughts, that, that we generate our thoughts. William James actually called this the quality of the mindness of our thoughts. But we all talk about, you know, anger swept over us. I don't know where it came from, it just came. Or this, 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 you know, I don't know where the poem came from. It just you know, popped into my mind. And you can ask, do, does your thought cause stuff? Not in your body, not, not whether it changes the way you behave, but could thinking about something change the way somebody else behaves or experiences their body? It's so the world of magic and witchcraft. And I, even pretty secular people kind of might have the intuition that they didn't want to sleep in a bed that somebody had died in because somehow something about the anguish of the death had, had sort of seeped into the sheets. Or, they, or they, you might have the intuition that, well, maybe anger lingers in the room after a fight. I'm going to call, call all of those kind of other things porosity, that there's this idea that there's a kind of um, boundary between the mind and the world, that there's a kind of innerness um, to mindish experiences, to awareness, that this is a feature of consciousness, and that you might have a bunch of cultural ideas, but you ever, all of us have intuitions. The thought might, could be sometimes located outside, that you don't own all your thought, that thoughts cause stuff, that thought is not entirely private, and that cultures and religions just take those intuitions and they develop them, they run with them. So, you know, Christians think that there are souls that can live outside the bodies, that, that, that God gives you thoughts, that God can read your thoughts, your mind isn't fully private, and that if you think very, very hard, what you think can change the world, what we might call that prayer. So th the term porosity I'm using to describe the idea that the mind world boundary is permeable in, not, in non ordinary ways. So recently I did this study with a bunch of people um, in five countries. And here they are, the United States, Ghana, Thailand, China, Vanuatu. And we worked with deeply religious people and with people in the general population. And we had college students fill out surveys. And we asked in many different ways and we used fieldwork methods and interview methods and survey methods. And one of the things we did is we asked in many different ways about porosity questions. So here's an example of the kind of question that we asked. Suppose in a distant community that's very much like this one, there's a woman called Martha. One day Martha realizes that her neighbor Mary is really, really angry at her and she's been angry for a long time. And then we asked a bunch of questions. You know, could, you know, could Mary hurt Martha just by the way that she's thinking about her? Supposing if Mary's a special kind of person, Supposing Mary is really, really angry. So, and we asked, you know, a version of that story with anger and caring, anger and caring and envy. And then we had another list of questions that we gave people. And what is kind of astonishing to me, even now, is that in five, in five countries, no matter how we did the research, no matter whether we were talking to religious people or non-religious people, or what kind of religion they were in, the more people thought that their minds were open and porous, the more they experienced the realness of spirits. The more they had the sense that the more that spiritual experience they reported and the more they had a sense that God was kind of more person-like. Um, and we also found in that same study that the more they said yes to absorption, the more they were likely to report spiritual experience. And I think we were able to show that porosity is not the same as religion, although there's a relationship because religion, I think porosity is a scaffolding off of which religious ideas build. These, these intuitions about scaffolding, about, about porosity are the uh, scaffolding out, out of which these ideas about um, porosity build more, more, more religion uh, builds its ideas. 
Um, and again, there's something sort of deep about the individual variation between people. Porosity is a little bit more cultural. Absorption is a little bit more like an individual trait. Why does it have that impact? Uh, why does porosity lead to more spiritual experience? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't have an entirely good answer, but I think that spiritual experience often arises from what I would call in-between experiences. Things that, you know, you see something out of the corner of your eye, you sort of feel something, you sort of, you, you sort of, you know, hear something that maybe is, you're not quite sure where it comes from. And if you are oriented to the, to the idea that the thought can move in and out of your mind, I think that acquires a kind of more substantial quality and helps it maybe perhaps pop into the world and you and it it feels more alive to you. So I'm not, but however we understand the story, there's a relationship that's quite striking. And that brings us in the end to spiritual experience. So one of the things that one of the reasons why spiritual experience is so important is that it gives people a first person sense that something other than themselves is there gives them a first person sense, a sensory experience of the invisible other. And that is often quite powerful for people who want to engage. They have this cognitive commitment to, the, to God, but they also have this, maybe they don't think of God as often as they should. Maybe God isn't, that doesn't feel as real to them as he, as he should be. So, the point I wanna make here is that these spiritual experiences aren't a way of talking. People feel this stuff. People feel, people sit, stand in a circle and they feel their hands growing hot when they, when they heal other people. They feel power moving through them. They feel as if they've been knocked over when the spirit sweeps down the, the, um, the, the central island, island, the church. They, might, they feel that their tongues are twisted and it's not their choice to speak in, in, in tongues and this kind of, in these phonemes that don't make any sense to them. They, it feels like it happens to them and somehow it's, it, it, that the power is moving through them. Here's uh, one of my favorite images of uh, it's just by Lippi and it hangs in a, in a Florentine church. This is St. Bernard talking and listening to talking with the Virgin and see. And of course, it's a supernatural experience of the senses. People feel demons. I, I know, I, I remember a woman who said that, that um, no, I remember a man who said it, it was in the corner of the room and I felt it. It quivered. I could just feel the power coming off of it. People feel presence. They feel it in different ways. There's a kind of presence where there's, there's, um, you know, you, you know exactly where in the room God is sitting or standing. You can't see him. You can't hear him, but you know exactly where he is. And then there's another kind of presence, which is much more common, in which God kind of wraps around somebody, or they feel hot they feel cold and they know that there's a, that there's a sense of, of, of another being. There are odder experiences as well, um, which you find both in Christianity and in, other, and, and in other religions in which the mind separates from the body and does stuff. So a little bit more common in, in Christianity is when another mind, usually God's mind, enters into the body and takes over the body and the, and the human can't really, isn't really can't remember what happened, but somehow God speaks to the body and speaks words that are true words of prophecy. There are experiences when people feel that they're leaving their body and they're traveling on the astral plane. And it's an, it's an experience. You can actually generate these experiences, something like these experiences in the lab. One of my um, favorite experiences to talk to people about and to, to think about is sleep paralysis. It's pretty common. So by the numbers, roughly a quarter of you will have had some experience of sleep paralysis. It's this moment where you uh, somebody feels is, is, is asleep but awake. They experience themselves to wake up, but their body still won't move. They can't move. They often have a sense of a weight against their chest. 
um, and a presence in the room, this is often quite a negative experience. Although there are some people who have sexually ecstatic sleep paralysis experiences. I think Jeffrey Kripal describes uh, one of those in at some length. Um, and it's because they're negative that they often become, you can find these experiences as, as evidence in you know, the early modern witch trials. One of the things I, I do in my work is to demonstrate that in different, different faiths, you'll find a different patterning of these spiritual experiences. One of the things that I think we've seen in our work in five countries is that it seems as if um, Christians are more likely to report inner experience than people of other faiths. Uh, that's quite intriguing that it comes up epidemiologically as well as, you know, describe, you know, Weber spoke of the, the existential, unprecedented inner loneliness. Well, there, there's many people have argued that Christianity um, encourages more interior experiences. And it turns out that when you talk to people about spiritual experiences around the world, that seems to, to resonate, seems to be true. Uh, the Buddhists uh, have a somewhat different pattern of spiritual experience. And I, I think about this as, as kindling um, different sensibilities, different expectations, different feelings, different visceral feelings of, of the realness of God. So what I've done is to talk about um, what I call kindling, this process of helping God to feel more real. Um, and I've said that there are five things that I can see at work in this process of increasing real felt realness of God. But there's a story about the narrative detail in a, par in a paracosm, a narrative detail in the texts people read that enable them to kind of think about God, point to God, experience God in their lives. That there's a story about some people being in some sense more um, you know, having a, a trait that helps them to experience this realness more easily, that practice helps everybody to develop more vivid inner experiences, that cultures which kind of cultivate a kind of a porous model of mind, they probably seem to, they seem to have more spiritual experiences, and that spiritual experiences really matter that um, a lot of people have them, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people of faith have them, and that they help people um, develop that sense, sense of God. So I just want to end with the observation that this process of real making changes people. And I think that these changes are part of what helps religion to uh, feel, to, to be so resilient. Um, why it is even after the prediction of the death of God, uh, God has not gone away for um, most people of the world, despite a safer, healthier world. And, and I, one can, can quarrel about that, but even in, in, but despite the fact that God was predicted to, 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 to die in the lat latter part of the 20th century, he just hasn't gone away. And I think that this may help us to understand that. And what I see is that religious practice is good for the mind. Um, I think when you, what I see is that religious practice, prayer is a lot like cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy, of course, is a practice in which a therapist teaches somebody who is struggling to replace unpleasant, unhelpful thoughts with positive, helpful, helpful thoughts. Like, you know, rather if you wake up at 3, 3 a.m. rather than thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. You think, I'm just going to be a little tired in the morning. It's not, not a big deal. Um, and prayer kind of works like that. You, 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 somebody who is praying is being calm and attended, attending to their inner experience and learning to replace whingy, negative, critical thoughts with grateful, thankful, purposeful thoughts. Um, I think the evidence suggests that that may, may be good for people. 
here's a kind of this this is none of my work but this is quite striking uh, so this uh, harold kernig is probably you probably know this work um finds that one of the resilient observations in medical science and social science is that religion is good for the brain and the body so there are many many papers they, they evaluate um religion very differently church membership relationship with god how often you go to church many many so this this is a survey of like over about three thousand papers and over two-thirds of them suggest that the religion factor being higher and however they're measuring religion produces less cardiovascular disease better immune function better endocrine function keeps people happier um there's something really it may add two to two to three years to people's lives um people still argue about this but there's something really robust i think it probably has something to do with the realness of god these effects this is again none of my own work probably religion is good for for society this is one of your your uh, fellow countrymen Aaron nor and zion i use that particularly big gods gods who have um, who are omniscient um, and omnipotent um, may facilitate large-scale cooperation, and people argue about that, but he probably has a piece of the truth. The thing that my work contributes that I think is kind of cool and which startled me is that as people make God real, God, they experience God as a social relationship. So they genuinely experience God as being more autonomous, not, not an idea that they have, but an experience of some, something outside that interacts with them. Um, this is undoubtedly, um, undoubtedly reduces, well, there's evidence that this reduces loneliness. Loneliness is terrible for you. Lonely, you know, John Cassiopo says that being lonely is equivalent, has the health consequences of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. But, they, but I think to my mind, um, the positive relationship with God, if it's positive, but you know, people are going to so much work to make it positive. If people are able to develop this relationship with God in which God feels autonomous, it's probably satisfying in its own right. So let me leave it there. I know that's a kind of big swath of conversation, but I'm, I'm eager to talk to you um, uh, uh, about what I've had to say. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerman. Uh, so we have time for questions and conversation. Um, would anyone like to uh, pose a question or a comment? Uh, Tinu, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that paper. Really, really interesting. Um, and I do apologize. Uh, I, I joined our Zoom just a little bit late, so I <clears throat> hope I'm not saying something you or ask about something that you already talked about. But uh, I'm just curious um, about, um, you know, you talked about how these effects, particularly at the end, seem to be more prevalent or more real as it were. Uh, if people think of God in a realist sense, right? That they believe God is real out there and all of that stuff, and you get these benefits. And so this, this realism seems, however, to be um, uh, difficult to square with any of the truth conditions that we might um, put on some of these statements, right? So I'm just wondering, um, typically, you know, the people that you're studying, would they think about these things in a kind of pragmatic context um you know james basically would dismiss the realist question and say well if it works for them that's really all we need and therefore truth is really just pragmatic uh, in that sense so that's the one question and the second one is um uh the neuroscience of all of this i wonder if you could talk about the neurology there because at least some of the things we might see as spiritual experience like speaking in tongues have a fairly good um, explanation, I think, in various forms of aphasia and stuff like that. And that's not to reduce them. I'm just, I think there's some good explanations as well. So I, those are great questions. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think my work speaks to the question of whether 
there is this invisible other who is present. I, I don't, I, I just have nothing to, it's just not what I do. It's not my job. Um, so I, and one of the things that I do do is work with people who call, call themselves tuplomancers. Does this name mean anything to people? No, you're all looking blank. So this is a, something that the uh, world of the internet has made possible. It's quite amazing. Uh, you spell it a little bit like tulip, but it's tulpa. Uh, and if you go on to tulpa.com, you will see this world at work. There are 30,000 folks who sign in to, to these uh, listservs. Um, Tulpamancy is an entirely secular, metaphysic-free practice. So in which people use techniques of um, inner sense cultivation to create invisible friends. Um, and the at, over time, as they practice, the invisible friend feels more and more real. And they start to have what you might call spiritual experiences of these invisible friends. And the invisible friends start to feel autonomous. They start to have this back and forth relationship with their, with their person. So I, I think that um, what I'm struck by is that even the most devout people I think have a different cognitive attitude towards the supernatural than they do to the everyday. I've actually just published a paper about this. And so to some, and, and I would say that part of that attitude is that in fact, people don't believe their religious claims as fully as ordinary factual stuff in the world. Like the, that I have a water bottle sitting on my table. I don't debate whether that's true. I just take it to be true. And God claims are a little bit different. So to some extent that the reason for the real making is that it to increase, to increase that feeling really matters. And for sure, it, the, that process of making real depends on the kind of default behaviors of our brain. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is more along the lines of, the, of experience, and I'm curious about this because when I was quite small, say three or four, I remember having this kind of experience, which I interpreted as God because I was in a family that went to church, and and it struck me as odd that other people didn't. I just sort of took it for granted. But at the same age, I also acquired an imaginary cat. Uh, and I was perfectly clear that this was an imaginary cat. Yeah. But I recall that my mother had to stop me from climbing out of a moving car because I needed to rescue my imaginary cat from the roof of the car. And I remember very earnestly explaining to her that, no, this was a real imaginary cat not right. an imaginary, imaginary cat. Have you run That's across that kind of explanation question. for? That's such a great issue. Um, and there are many, I've been kind of trying to wrestle my way through that question of the relationship between the imagination and the non, the non imaginary commitment to, to God. So I think what you are speaking to, so, just for the, on, on the record, um, there is the claim, and Alison Gopnik's probably a little bit more on this side of that, this, the claim, that um, imagination and treating what must be imagined as kind of real is something that kids do more than adults. So you get some psychologists who will say that. You get my buddy, Paul Harris, who says, even from a very, very young age, kids will distinguish between what is imagined and what is real. I suspect that both of those are true, that um, there is a sense in which kids can draw the boundary pretty well. I mean, they do what you did, you know, this might have an imaginary cat, but they also um, are better at suspending disbelief. So they are better at suspending disbelief about their imaginary cat. And I think that, um, I'm sort of trying to fret about this. I think that uh, some people will say kids are ha have higher absorption levels. I don't think that's 
I don't think we have the data to support that, but but I think there's I think there's something about um, whatever absorption does, or whatever absorption involves, kids do more of it, and that individual temperament makes a difference to how people sort that out and develop it or not develop it, and that kids are a little funkier about the 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 the, the boundaries that they're that they're drawing. So. It turns out that adults do that as well. So kids, I hear more stories of kids, and you know that, um, and that of course there's some kids who do it a lot. So the more imaginative kids do more of it, uh, more creative kids do more of it. Um, but adults also are good at distinguishing, and then bad at distinguishing. Uh, so anyway, that's um, it's a very rich question. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lerman. Uh, Joel. Yeah, thanks for your talk today. And uh, thanks for your earlier work of uh, When God Talks Back, and the sociologist of religion found that a really helpful resource for uh, different thinking. So thank you for that. Uh, near the end of your talk today, you mentioned that uh, Christians seem to have a better handle on the inner religious or spiritual uh, experience. And I'm wondering if your research um, views Christians as a whole like that, or particular segments, like Orthodox, Catholic, mainline, conservative Protestants, and what kind of social or cultural reasons you think are in play, whether again, it's Christians overall or particular segments within Christianity? That's a great question. So our, our um, we haven't looked that carefully at the data yet. Um, I, I think that our, I think, that our data mostly focuses on charismatic Christian evangelicals. So people who, who theologically model this in, you know, intimate relationship with God. So they're probably a little bit farther out there than I would guess than Orthodox Christians or than Catholics. But you know, Catholics do plenty of this inner experience of God as well. But so, um, this, this is such a long-standing theological, or not theological, sociological, historical debate. Did, does Christianity increase individualism? And if so, when? And does it happen in the Reformation? Does it happen in the 12th century, which has something to do with guilds? Does it happen with Augustine and you know, the emergence of an auto, a Christian autobiography? Is it really due to the, you know, to the gospels? Uh, and to the important centrality of the I believe statement. I, I suspect all those play a role. Um, so I, I don't know. And, and I, I also, sometimes people want to say to me, oh, it's only Christians who do this kind of cuddle with a spirit thing. And I don't think that's true either. I think that, you know, there are, so my, friend Sarah Ellis Johnson says, no, no, no. There were plenty of Greeks who wanted to kind of hang out with Artemis and you know, treat Apollo as an imaginary friend. And so I think there's this kind of mixture of, kind of sort of in this, my response to America, this mixture of human capacity, which is part of being human and cultural cultivation and individual orientation. So there's something like trait, human capacity, and theological elaboration. I do tend to think that um, the, the evangelical Christians are probably a little farther out there, are more likely to cultivate the interior experience. We'll try to look at that. That's great, thank you. Hi, thank you for that. That was wonderful uh, talk. Um, I was what I was wondering uh, about distinctions, and I really uh, liked your uh, reference to cognitive behavioral therapy and this notion of transformation and how uh, people can change through, I guess, ritual and different practices. And I'm sure you've probably uh, discussed this elsewhere, but I'm, I'm also thinking about method acting. Mm -hmm. uh, way a person uh, can put themselves into a frame of mind and 
create a, a, a world, this, uh, this, I guess you're the paracosm, you know, this imaginary world, which is the play or the theater or the, you know, the film that they're in. And, and then you, you said too, what you found um, really powerful was that with no exceptions that you're looking at the experience of God, uh, mm -hmm. the people look at it as a social relationship or to, mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you see a distinction in those three things? Let's say method acting and cognitive behavioral behavior therapy, and this third thing that is the notion of God as experience, as personal relationship, or are they are they the same in different ways? Or do you see a distinction among um, with the religious context? So, another great question. This is clearly a great community. Um, it, again, I think there's a story about human capacity and, and cultivation. So I'm totally with you that method acting creates paracosms, although, you know, it's really meant to be true about a paracosm is that it's really rich. So I think with method acting, you need to go to quite a bit of effort if you're really going to be that, you know, you know, be, if you're going to act, if you're going to be in Macbeth to do method acting, you really have to know Macbeth pretty well, I, I guess. And anyway, it's, um, so I, I'm struck by how rich, richly interactive they are rich, the, the narrative world, let's say the Bible is something that people, there's just so much to detail that people work with, put together, engage with, and, you know, they do it in, 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 in Ghana, where I spent some time, people are really reading the Bible, and in the evangelical communities in Chicago and Palo Alto, people are sort of reading the Bible and go, going for more, you know, God, more fun walks with God. Um, but you know, so there di there are different flavors to the paracosm. Um, but um, you know, I think one of the puzzles here is something that I've been really puzzling about, which is how to how should we think about the human mind? So what is what does this teach us about mind? And I haven't thought that through well yet. I don't feel like I have a finished answer. But I think there are two things I see. I, I kind of grew up with this idea that I, my mind was a vast interior awareness. You know, it was all mine, it was huge, and it was infinite, it was just like the universe, it was just inside me. And the more I think about the world of religion, the more I think that my awareness is really a social experience, first of all, that there's, it's, it's sort of in, in, there's this kind of intuitive other person there. And if I work on it, then the intuitive other can, can become more present. And I have all these bumbling thoughts, and if I work on them, maybe some of the critical ones will disappear. I haven't done that well enough yet, but um, it's, you know, it, it's really striking how widespread therapy is and how much, how much we feel we need more of it. You know, it's sort of like, it's, we can all learn to do this stuff, but it's not so easy. Um, and I'm also struck by the fact that this interior experience of awareness is full of texture that people are managing their thoughts in part by choosing between their thoughts by the quality of the thought um, does come from God. You can, make it, you can make a thought feel more external. You can make a thought feel more like it's not yours. Um, you can um, practice having fewer thoughts. And so there are, so therapy is about the techniques people use. Paracosm is about the way people kind of cultivate the imagination by adding more in. And the kind of God is about, I think, the way that these practices startlingly create a sense of a back and forth. So, you know, there's this kind of push me, pull you story about, um, about God. I mean, this is, this, this is all a little hand waving, but there is a sense and you know, and this is the kind of cognitive science of religion piece of it. All these intuitions, all these ideas about people in the mind, they're so easy to generate for people. 
right? It's just, you know, you anthropomorphism. You, you look at a car and you see a human face. But you look at a car and you mostly see a car, right? So to get that car into the real imaginary cat, you got to do stuff. It's sort of amazing that if you do stuff, the, the, the car becomes more like a person or maybe the cat. Maybe. I don't have this relationship with my car, but I, I, can, I can get there with an imaginary cat. Um, and so anyway, that, that's slightly rambling. But I think what you're trying to reach for is the puzzle of how what, what this should teach us to think about the nature of the mind. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. As um, I have a question too, as other people think about um, what they might want to add to the conversation. One thing I'm, so I'm teaching a class on religious experience and uh, I have the students do an exercise where they design a practice and engage in the practice for two weeks. It can be any kind of practice. It doesn't have to be um, religious. So sometimes people go on nature walks. Some of them choose to meditate. I had a couple of students, students choose to fast. Some listen to music. They, the only rule is that it has to be something that um, supports their well-being, their well-being, and then our goal is to discover how difficult it is to um, represent experience. We're not really aiming to uh, get a religious experience per se, but to think about the relationship between representation and experience itself. Um, but it, listening to your talk made me realize that in that designing that exercise, I, I really emphasized uh, practice mm -hmm. as the way to maybe get at something that would produce at least a heightened sense of awareness. And that made me wonder um, in this recent study where you're working in five countries, what are some of the things that happen if um, in a certain community or an individual person, some of those five factors are more developed than others or one is missing? Like what if you have high porosity but not enough pericosm or right. you know, I'm kind of thinking about the relationship between those five factors and what you observe. So that's so great. I, you know, people, Religion is immensely complicated and people are immensely complicated. So, you know, I can see that all of these th five things matter and I can see, oh, you know, I can see that, gee, everybody has some kind of cool experience. Everybody's doing some kind of practice, but it's pretty hard. I, I have um, ideas about how they're connected, but it's, it's hard to feel confident about uh, the, the real relationships between them. It is, you know, so what is going on? Here's a puzzle. Um, Ghana is a remarkably religious place. Why is that? You know, why is, um, why does the supernatural matter so much in West Africa? Well, um, you could give, you know, are these different kinds of people? Are they, are, are they, are they all sort of higher in absorption? That's probably not true. Do they do much, much more practice than other people? Well, you, you, you could, you know, you could probably give a, people certainly care about um, practicing and praying and doing stuff. They've got a culture in which they, um, they have a very porous model of the mind. Uh, so there's a lot of ideas in Ghana about thoughts going out into the world and affecting bodies and other people's thoughts coming into your body and affecting you. Um, I do think that one of the things that anthropologists have been good at doing is saying that there's certain cultural, there's certain social features that are more likely to give rise to certain kind of theological ideas. So, um, you know, people, um, anthropologists have shown, for example, that humans living in small face-to-face -face communities that practice agriculture are much more likely to have witchcraft ideas that humans that are, that are in small, you know, hunting gathering groups. Um, they're also, the folks in the agricultural communities are more likely to have witchcraft ideas than folks in cities, although that turns out to differ if your city starts falling apart. Um, and it kind of, kind of depends on how you count Q. Anyway, um, there, you, you can claim that there are plenty of witchcraft ideas floating around in American society at the moment. Um, so I tend to think 
the, the richness of the imagination of the paracosm, absorption, kind of travel together. I tend to think that practice will improve absorption as well as improve other things. I think that spiritual experience tends to travel with all of that. So the more you, so it's not, you know, people are very complicated. These are not the same things as each other, but they kind of hang together. And um, I, so that's kind of what I think. It's actually a really deep question about spiritual experience, by the way. It's, um, it's parallel to the question of whether psychiatric illnesses are different from each other or all the same. Mm. So there was a period, and you, you probably remember this, but there was a period when psychoanalysis dominated psychiatry where people didn't make distinctions between depression, and bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. I mean, they had those words, but the clinicians didn't think they were very helpful distinctions. They didn't pay a lot of attention to them. And then there was this period after um, 1980, late 70s, in which people were very, this clinician scientists were very, very excited about the sharp lines that distinguished schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, bipolar one, bipolar two, you know, major depressive disorder. They were, and they were very excited about seeing those as distinct things caused by different phenomenon in the body. And now, Psychiatric scientists have really started to think, oh no, you know, they're different, but there are no sharp lines between anything. And really what we're looking at is a complex series of continua. I think that spiritual experience is a little bit like that. So there's a big difference between James's mystical experience and sleep paralysis and hearing a voice and having a vision, but the more you look at it carefully, the harder it is to say, oh, this, this is a sharp line, and this is the core nature of mysticism, and the core, you know, it, it's, so they're, but at the same time, they're not the same as each other. So how to think deeply about that is really interesting. So my buddy Antaeus thinks a bit about that as well. Thank you so much. I want to make sure other people have a chance to ask questions too, but I do have another question. And if I don't see a hand here, I'll dive into my, I want to, I want to change tacks a little bit because I want to seize the opportunity to also talk about methodology yeah. um, because you um, have so much experience entering into communities and, mm -hmm. and really engaging and listening to them and in order to produce your work. Can you, do you have advice for, uh, we have graduate students here with us. And I'm also embarking on my first um, ethnographic project. And so what advice do you have for people as they um, go into the process of entering a community and trying to listen? Um, please tell oh, us about your so method. That's a great question. So you're talking about how to do ethnography. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I think it's really good to sort of, to imagine yourself a little bit like an idiot. Um, and that's not quite true, but you know, you're, it's, it's super, it's helpful to know there's what you might call an anthropological and ethnographic relationship and a real relationship. So you are trying to, in your ethnographic relationship, you're trying to be, um, naive, you're trying to understand from the bottom up, you're trying to presume that you don't know who God is, what a, what a worshiper is. Um, you are also trying to um, be fully um, non-judgmental, really hard to do in religion. Um, my, I was trying to, I was talking to a psychoanalyst about this once, he said that when, and forgive me for, for, for my language, he said that if you want to be a really good interviewer, you have to be open for somebody who tells you that they masturbate to meatloaf, which is, of course, quite not something that I resonate with. Um, you have to be ready for the person who tells you 
that the political figure you hate is just a great big fluffy teddy bear and all those people are out to lunch and you have to sit there and you have to be you know willing to be there you also have a real relationship and so you also have to be a person in relationship to that person. So you are both trying to be totally, totally open. But if somebody um, walks up to you and starts talking, you don't need to behave appropriately as the person that you are. You have to express your condol condolence, your joy. So you're trying to kind of both hold back on the things that might offend somebody um, be open to whatever they have to say, but also be kind of um, genuinely a person because if you really are just a fly on the wall, nobody's going to talk to you, right? So you, so trying to be as curious as you can be. So one of the things that I do, particularly when I uh, when I talk to people about their experience of God, is I tell me, how do you know? How, how did you know that God was there? what gave you this this the sign um when did you first know um when did you you know like leave what tell me more about that the imaginary cat how old were you were you did you ever get a real cat um do you do you remember that 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 you know cat, tell, tell me more did you ever feed that cat your imaginary cat um you know what did your mom say and you know, so you, you're both there as a real person, but you're also trying to figure things out. The other thing that's, I think is super helpful to, to, to realize is that, um, you know, you are with this person that you're talking to and you want from them a dissertation or a book. So you have, you're quite instrumental in, you know, in your relationship with them. And that really has, there's two things to first to think about. First of all, they may not be as excited about talking to you as you are about talking to them. So you need to do more of the work. You know, you need to be as, as interested as you can be, as open as you can be. Um, the other thing is that the, the, the they might be instrumentally interested in you for different reasons. Sometimes the way I talk about this is that, you know, some people, some researchers go into a Christian church, they want, you know, they're talking to somebody and they want to write a book about that other person. The other person wants their soul. And so it's, that can be quite, um, can feel quite uneven. So I, did, I remember one of the places where I did some ethnographic research where, um, people were so insistent upon where I was in my walk with Jesus that I just thought it was going to be hard for me to, to function effectively. Um, the vineyard was, had a kind of different model. I, you know, and, and I, and I can, uh, am able to construct a understanding of God that, you know, means that I work well in the vineyard context and people feel comfortable talking with me and I'm entertaining to people and it's just sort of fun. There's another church that I chose not to work in. Um, and, and that was a church that was actually a cult. Um, and I thought that the practices they did were really, really powerful. Um, they did these est-like practices um, and for nine days at a time and so you were pretty isolated from other people. And I thought they were very, very interesting, but that, that I didn't trust myself with them, that they, these techniques were so powerful that I wasn't comfortable doing that. And so I did not work in that community. So I think that it's super helpful to know that as well. Um, you need to take care of yourself um you need to be respectful you need to be curious you need to go home and write write up your notes super important it is uh, <laughs> you can be the best you can be the best interviewer in the world and if you don't write up your notes you don't have any data um and that's also really really important 
Thank you so much. That um, articulation of the real relationship and then the ethnographic relationship is, is so helpful and, and navigating between the two of those is, uh, thank you so much for um, describing that process. I think there was a question that I, I missed, Ian Kinney. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Are you still here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> Go ahead. Wonderful. I um, Thank you so much for your talk. This has been uh, very insightful. I'm uh, really curious about your thoughts around uh, the paracosm and um, the sort of you described it as how effective religions all are often paracosms themselves. And these narrative worlds are deeply detailed stories. And you drew, I, I think, a really appropriate comparison to Harry Potter. Right. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a literary scholar myself and a writer. And I'm curious what sorts of paris, parallels might exist between this concept of paracosm that you're helping, that you used to help understand um, this spiritual experience and religion of, within religion. Mm -hmm. and um, how fandom occurs and how these cultures of, of uh, in, in contemporary Western American culture, how um, cosplay and Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games often have these sort of shared narrative worlds that resemble in many ways cognitive behavioral therapy and have all of these li narrative literary devices to them as well. And I'm wondering what makes those um, social groupings and those narrative worlds um, distinct from their spiritual experience to those uh, in, in more uh, religious organizations or institutions? Like, is there a difference, I guess, is my question. Great question. So, you know, I think that's one of these human capability sort of stories. So I think that what makes Dungeons, I, I actually, I'm not a, a real Dungeons and Dragons person. I know it from, you know, people who, who I know it from TV. I don't actually do Dungeons and Dragons. I, I, I wandered a little bit into the fan fiction world just to see what that's like. And um, I think that's that's quite a fascinating world. But I think that these role-playing games and you know, the fan fiction is very much like religion. And I've struggled with the question of how to think about the uh, difference in epistemic claim. So people hang out with Harry Potter, they hang out with Harry Potter, they write stories. They tend not to think that Harry Potter is real. So I think that what happens in religion is that you know, you're, um, you've got a claim about something and the claim is that this is real. Um, using the narrative capacity helps to feel more real. Um, but I think the realness claim, I mean, one of the, a study I've never done, but would love to do is whether people ever experience Harry or the dragon in supernatural ways. So it's, you know, so people have these bodies that have cool, weird experiences, but people who are religious have more of those experiences and people who practice have more of those experiences. And I think there's a something about the way that people attend that to their, the edges of their thought that make these more likely. Mm -hmm. But I'm really struck that nobody has ever pulled me aside to say that Harry showed up to them. No, and, and I don't know whether that's, um, so I th think that there's this epistemic claim that may be making a difference in the way people allow their thought. So I, mean, I should say that however you understand the ultimate source of your supernatural experience, I think that the um, cool weird experiences people have are basically thought like stuff that's experienced externally. It's connected in different neural net nets in different ways. So that the, you know, so there's one neuroscience story to tell about you know, um, sleep paralysis. There's another about out-of-body experiences. There's probably people argue about what's going on with voices, but there's um, voices I know best. Probably when somebody hears God speak to them, there's, um, some interpretation of thought like stuff so that the thought feels more, ex more external and the feeling changes the experience of the thought. And then it happens very, very quickly. There's, a, there's this woman called um, Marsha Johnson, who's one of the key architects in this way of thinking that there's this a judgment of something as not being your own as you judge it as not being your own, it sort of is experientially flipped so that it changes the 
the tag of the experience and the tag flips the way you experience it so it's experienced more sensorially um i think that the epistemic tag makes a makes a difference to the willingness to judge your thought but that that's my guess um, but in any event i think there's a different set of stories about how the epistemic tag how the epistemic stance or tag or, or framing is put in place and how the experience works and, and i would put the paracosm in the domain of kinds of things that explain the experience it's, it's a really good question I'm, I'm it's giving me all sorts of ideas i'm I'd be really curious to learn if uh, those in cosplay communities and those who are really invested in these narrative worlds um ever report having these sorts of epistemic experiences or these spiritual encounters yeah. so thank you so yeah. much yeah i think it's a great question if you find out let me know okay wonderful we i think we probably have time for one maybe two more questions and um, uh, many of our graduate students are here would any of you like to ask a question uh, highway. highway. Yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, this was very interesting. Uh, and as many others have said, I've, I've learned so much and it's real great. I was just wondering in terms of the practices, um, one thing that struck me in terms of, especially when you covered evangelical versus other orthodoxies, uh, or denominations, I should say, of Christianity, I was wondering if there, the in terms of the practices, there's an element of the environment involved. Because I believe, um, in terms of evangelical, there's very much a sense of building up the community and a calling to convert others, um, as opposed to say something like where someone might sequester themselves in a monastery. Mm -hmm. Or even in terms of meditation, which can be very internal and be and focus on the um, on your own sense and connection with the gods. I was wondering if there was any sort of like meaningful difference between those activities and those environments. I think that's a great question. Um, and in some sense, again, humans are really complicated. Religion is really complicated. You know these. Um, there are social groups to create joint religious projects in every social world. There are isolation, people isolate themselves to experience God in every social world. I do think that um, in, there's a story about risk to self that I think is kind of interesting. So the more isolated the group, the easier, the, these are my thoughts. Um, um, I think the more isolated the group, the easier it is for um, ideas to, faith claims to look like delusions. And the more isolated the person, the easier it is for somebody to have a psychotic break. So it's actually, this is actually something that's deeply important about meditation that people don't really talk about. But meditation is an enormously helpful healing tool. And some people who do those nine day retreats kind of have a psychotic break. So there's something about, you know, you, you, these, all these practices are ways of altering your everyday relationship to the world. And that's kind of wonderful because often we are incredibly hard on ourselves, right? I mean, uh, um, you, you have lots of internal critique thoughts and run, running through your minds all the time. So we're just, humans are just really hard on themselves. So the lucky human is not, but most people are just really hard on themselves. And so religion is one of the most powerful ways of shifting that inner world. Um, but some of those techniques, you know, anything that is a sword can cut both ways. Some of those most powerful techniques to make you ecstatically involved with God, you know, do are pretty harmful to some bodies. I mean, not, again, it's only, uh, um, what is that, 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 that
So most people who do these 10 day meditations when they're, you know, they're not moving for the whole day or they're, you know, these really intense, I mean, many, many people love them and it's wonderful, but you know, you change something, you change your everyday world so dramatically and it's pretty hard on a few people. So again, that, that, that's, I think there's something deeply true about religion that it's a tool to change and anything that's done beyond moderation has various risks great thank you so much and we have time for one last question and uh, charles, charles would you please, yes would you please ask your question Charles, are you there? Okay. There we, go. we can't hear you yet. I can see that you're unmuted. And now he's muted. And now he's muted, yeah. Do you want to type your question in the chat, Charles, and I can read it out? It could be that the microphone didn't get connected. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. Yes. It's very frustrating. Then you need to restart your computer, and oh, I know it can be a your lecture class is looking at you, <laughs> and you know what kind of idiot has failed to. Yeah. Well, we'll see if um we'll see if uh, Charles can type it into the chat for us. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a closing question? I have a question about ethics, but I think it would be too long. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Um, the, so I don't know what the ethics process is like in the United States. I haven't had to do it there, but um, here it is. Um, um, well, I think it's probably a big process there too, but it's a big process here. Even from, I have another class I teach on ritual and even for students to go and observe a, a Catholic mass or a local um, ritual, we have to go through a, a very elaborate ethics process. And so I was wondering, um, you know, sometimes it makes you feel like, oh, it'd be so, uh, how, how can I even convince the ethics board that I can go and talk with people? Um, and, and the ethics board wants to have lots of detail about, especially what that first communication will be like. So I'm wondering how um, in the midst of the real relationship and the ethnographic relationship, uh, how you, um, how ethics, how you are able to manage the ethics process so that you're able to have those relationships because um, of course, ethics is really important, and it can also feel like, well, how can I even, uh, how can I, how can I satisfy the ethics, um, uh, the ethics conditions? Well, I, I, I think that, you sh so I don't worry too much about the ethics. I think it's helpful not to provide more information on your ethics form than you need. Uh, I think you should spend a couple of hours filling out these forms. At least in, in my my neck of the woods, people think that anthropologists are pretty kind of low risk and it's the people who stick you know needles into spines that are really you really want to be super careful about um in america as as it's or in america in, in the united states as it's understood typically a public event is you do not need um permission research permission to attend um and i think it's helpful when you write those statements to to write the IRB as inclusively as you can so you don't want to say these are 10 questions that i will ask and no more i will only i'm going to talk to 22 people you don't want to do that you want to say i'm going to talk to at least 22 people these are the kinds of questions that i'm going to ask i will interview people in the place of their choosing um, rather than, you know, I, in a quiet room. You, you, uh, one piece of advice before I leave, never, never, ever anonymize your field notes before, <laughs> you know, you want to anonymize your publications, but your field notes, um, unless you absolutely have to, um, you know, you are a burden on people's time if you go and you do research. And it's such a waste if you can't figure out who you were talking to because you, you've called you've called Tony Bill and now you you know in your notes you can't figure out who Bill is and you can't remember whether Bill is the guy who went to this event or to that event or 
you know, whatever. So. Struggling with how, how to craft the proposal so that you know, it is ethically sound and also leaves enough margin for the, real, the reality of social interaction. <laughs> so right. I really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Lerman, thank you so much. We um, are really lucky to have had the chance to, to hear from you. Thank you for your talk and for your uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking answers. I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling like um, this was a really vibrant discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thanks, Troy. Thank you, Dr.